Hello and welcome. My name is Stefan Schneider. I'm a expert for software engineering excellence and developer experience at McKinsey. And together with my colleague Mike Gatto, we will be talking about developer platform reference architectures today. I'd like to start with this picture um, because this is the reality we, we see at many, uh, many of our enterprise clients. Um, Years and years of lacking standardization um, in organizations and also a large amount of just legacy technology that has been growing wider and wider um, just make a very complex environment uh, for, uh, for software engineers in, uh, in large organizations. Yeah? Um, we then have growing more and more complex technology tool chains, deployment delivery tool chains, yeah? Uh, and that is also then, then backed by uh, heavily manual uh, manual work, non-value adding adding work um, engineers and operations folks uh, uh, actually have to do, right? and and all that just um, adds up to to a poor uh, experience for for software engineers. Yeah? Um, and where does that lead, right? So number one, productivity and, and innovation, right? If I have to wait. Um, hours and, and days until my, my code is, is testable and or even even months until it, it hits production, right? I, I just get frustrated as an engineer, right? And that obviously brings innovation to an halt. Huh? Um, but it also increases pressure on, on, on operations folks, right? So that is then waiting time for, for other teams. Um, there is constantly constantly pressure on, on, on people to let's say do the, do their ticket ops, right? Um, and these then teams don't have the capacity and time or uh, get their headspace to actually work on the debt and, and, and invest in, in, in automations. You know? um, and then on, on top of that comes this increased cognitive load for, for developers. Right? So today as a developer with the idea of you build it, you run it, um, I suddenly, I need to stay current on the latest software engineering practices. Uh, the, the latest tooling, I actually need to understand how to run the show in production, um, plus understand how, how to integrate with all the cloud service, cloud service offerings out there, and then actually also keep pace, uh, keep up with the ever-increasing pace of, of feature delivery that is, that is required. Right? Um, and then having the, let's say, an ever-increasing explosion of, of complexity of, of enterprise application landscapes just doesn't make it easy. Right? Um, so, and, but what, what in the end, what, what do organizations want to achieve? And, and that is developer experience and productivity for developers. You know? And how do I get there? By standardizing the engineering approach. Right? So that means, on the one hand, um, applying and, and basically applying this wide and globally in the organization uh, engineering industry practices, right? Just following the, the basic cosmetics, but also the, um, the, the best practices. Yeah? Um, that also means I need to empower and enable my engineers, right? Self-service, abstracting away unnecessary complexity, right? To also then enable faster onboarding and faster uh, delivery for, for our engineering uh, population. Yeah? Uh, and that means I need to standardize the tech stack and tool chain underneath. Yeah? And one means for that is a developer platform. And with that, handing over to my, my colleague, Mike, who will uh, lead you into this. Thanks, Stefan. Hi, my name is Mike Gatto, and I'm a senior DevOps engineer at McKinsey & Company. Today, I want to take a high-level view of the reference architecture that we use to deploy an MVP developer platform. So in this case, we're start with the top, with the developer control section here, and we're looking at our version control. So this is where all of our developers uh, publish their code that they write, and along with their code, in order to kind of provide the necessary information to run their application as a container in a Kubernetes environment, they provide a workload specification. Now, this is just a YAML config file that you know codifies things such as the image to use, any resources like CPU and memory, as well as any external dependencies. So things like, does it need a database, for example? So once that code is checked in, a CI pipeline gets kicked off, and that first, it actually builds the application code into a container or multiple containers and then publishes them to a registry. Once that's done, the CI pipeline then notifies the platform orchestrator 
of the new artifacts in the registry and kicks off a build. So the platform orchestrator is managed by a different team, the platform team, and they configure uh, based on the environment. They might have different settings, for example, different clouds, different Kubernetes clusters, but that they basically examine the score file that was provided by the application team or by the developer team, you know, compare it against their configurations, look at what they, what resources they already have provisioned and what still needs to be provisioned to kind of meet this new requirement. They combine that with any Terraform code that they have to manage provisioning of those resources, which is stored in GitHub. And they use that to provision those resources. So for example, compute, if there isn't an existing Kubernetes cluster, one will be built. Um, in this case, the application might need databases. So we'll have you know, MySQL databases being provisioned and whatnot to support that. So kind of moving on to um, more of the AWS specific architecture. Um, obviously there's different architecture for, AWS, for Azure and GCP. So this is a pretty standard um, VPC at Amazon, three tiers uh, subnets. So we have our web subnet, our app subnet, and our database subnet. We have EKS cluster, which is Amazon's Kubernetes service cluster, the nodes deployed into the app subnet. And then in databases we need, so we have two databases actually required for our reference application. Um, and those are deployed in the database subnet. Now we're gonna move on to a live demo where we'll actually show this all in action. In this demo, I'm going to be showing how we were able to separate developer and operations concerns by using this developer platform in a box solution that we built. This solution uses a combination of a workload specification tool and a platform orchestrator. For the workload specification tool, we're using an open source project called SCORE. And for the platform orchestrator, in this demo, we're using Humanitech, but you can use other options as well. So what this solution does is it allows us to set up an MVP developer platform for a client in about a day which is a fairly complex thing. And the reason we're able to do this is because all the architecture is defined in code and only requires a minimal setup. Um, for example, we need a cloud account, whether it's AWS, Azure, GCP, etc., and the configuration information on how to connect into that. Now, as part of the solution, we're also developing application patterns for developers and platform teams to kind of serve as a showcase of what's possible with the solution and to give some ideas. And it also serves as a starting point for developers to kind of create their own application patterns that better suit their needs. So what I'm showing here is a three-tier uh, sample, uh, sample banking application. Uh, and as part of this demo, we're actually going to walk through how this actually works and actually deploy it to AWS. So this application is made up of three microservices, which will run as uh, pods inside of Kubernetes eventually. Uh, so we have our front end service, our money API service, and our users API service. So if I click in the money API, you know, this is all built out of JavaScript and this will be Docker container. So you see the usual suspect files, um, our Docker file and our other um, source code here. But I wanna draw attention to this score.yaml file. And as the name suggests, this is the configuration file for our score workload specification tool. So if I click in and look at the contents, a lot of this is going to look familiar to anybody who's worked with containers before. You know, we have our container image, we have CPU and memory re uh, resource requirements and our variables that we pass in. But notice at the bottom, we have this resources definition here for a database of type MySQL. But we don't have any of the other usual information you would need, such as the host, the port, the username and the password. Um, and that's because from the developer perspective, developers don't care where or how this, this MySQL instance comes into being. They just care that it's there as a prerequisite for their application. So what will happen is that score the score tool will translate this and send it over to our platform orchestrator, and then we're gonna build it in our target environment. Speaking of target environment, let's take a look over there now. So in this demo, we're gonna use AWS. So I have here an AWS sandbox account um, that is pretty empty. Um, so what we're gonna need here is we're gonna need a VPC, we need a Kubernetes cluster, which we're gonna run in Amazon's Elastic Kubernetes service. And we're gonna need a MySQL database, which is gonna run in Amazon's RDS relational database service. So let's start with the VPCs. So as you can see here, there's a VPC already, but this is the default VPC that comes with the account. I don't wanna use this. I want my own VPC set up the way that I want it. So we're gonna create one there. For Kubernetes, we're gonna to go to EKS. We currently do not have any clusters, so we're gonna to need to fix that and generate one. And for RDS, we're going to need a, a grand total of two databases um, for our money API and users API services. 
Um, and if I look over in RDS right now, I currently have no databases. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to uh, provision those. Now to provision them, I mentioned that score will talk to our platform orchestrator. So that's where we have here. So right now I'm looking at the resource definitions in my platform orchestrator. And what this does, it allows platform teams to define where and how applications get deployed. You know, for example, um, in a development environment, we might have very different um, Kubernetes cluster um, settings, you know, number of nodes and how, you know, how big and how expensive they are based on whether it's, you know, development versus, you know, staging or QA versus production. Um, and they can, they set all this up and they figure, and they write the Terraform code for this. And this allows them to control that process. And again, uh, by separating developer and platform team concerns and giving and allowing them to control their respective areas that they're experienced in um, separately without requiring too much overlap there, what we're doing is we're making deployments more compliant and better aligned with the client initiatives. So now that's being said, so we're going to go ahead and deploy an application. So if I go up to applications here in my orchestrator, I currently have no applications defined here. So we're going to fix that. We're going to create an application called Bank Demo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off, and we'll see it's an empty application. There's nothing in here yet. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off a pipeline in GitHub Actions that's going to generate the code for our, for our application here. And then we're going to take a pause and come back and let that build. Um, so the actual provisioning of the ABS resources is going to take about 20 minutes or so. So we'll give that some time to uh, provision, and then we'll come back and take a look at it. So we've given it some time, and it looks like the deployment is successfully completed. As you can see here, it shows in the running state. If I look into the deployment details here, I should see my three microservices. And what that means is that all of these resources, these resources have been, have been deployed to AWS. So if I go back to my AWS console, you can see I have my two databases that I mentioned earlier that are needed by the Money API and the Users API. I go over to my VPC here, whereas before I had the one default VPC that came with the AWS account, now I have a second one, um, which includes all of the subnets and route tables and normal network plumbing that you would expect from AWS. And I should now have a Kubernetes cluster if I go over to the Kubernetes service here. Whereas before I had no clusters, I now have a cluster that is running my microservices. So if I bring up a console window here, I can go in and examine the contents of the Kubernetes cluster. So if I look at the namespaces here, you'll see that I have the normal Kubernetes namespaces. I have an ingress Nginx controller, which handles our communication in from the outbound world so we can get to our application, which we will in a second. And then I have this randomly generated namespace name here. This is where those microservices have been deployed. So if I list the pods for those, for that namespace, you'll see that I have my three microservices right here. Um, along with, you'll see some Fluent Bit containers here. These are put there by the platform orchestrator just so we can monitor what's going on in here. So now I actually want to go to my website. So I need to get the DNS name. Um, so I, we are using um, dynamically generated DNS names. So if I look at my ingress object for this namespace, I should see a name that I can plug into my browser here to get to my demo application. So we'll see it right here. This points to an AWS resource here. And here's my name. So if I go up here to my browser and I paste that in, and here we are. This is the demo banking application that we just deployed uh, from scratch, just from code, where we had the score config file. We passed it into our platform orchestrator, which built all of our resources out based on the Terraform definitions provided by the platform team. And we ended up with a fully deployed application. Thanks, Mike. Um, so with, with this reference architecture, um, we address some of these issues we, we mentioned earlier, right? So, first of all, um, I'm reducing time from my idea to my first line of code that I actually write that, that solves a customer problem with these, with these application patterns, you know, um, and then standardized setups. But also from my commit until the code is actually in production, right? Down, from, down to hours instead of uh, weeks and months, you know? Um, the pressure from ops teams I, I release by um, providing self-service access and, and automating away these, um, uh, these complexities. You know? um, in terms of the co cognitive load for developers, that is also abstracted away on the one hand with application patterns by providing standardized setups. 
um, but also then um, with dynamic configuration management, um, reducing this ex explosion of complexity by keeping standardization and keeping my, my stack and application to, to the standards defined on the, by the platform team. Yeah. Um, but a developer platform is, is, is in that case, first of all, just a tool, right? And it requires a lot more than just technology um, to really improve developer experience and productivity at scale, right? So um, starting with, with the foundation, so getting the architectural principles and direction in place against which that platform team, your platform teams can then operate, right? So that starts with cloud strategy, the, the, the proper guardrails on, on tooling and making also very opinionated decisions on how to use and build technology, right? Huh? Um, our capabilities and mindset. So it requires a really strong engineering culture which is embraced from, from top leadership, right? Um, so that also, for example, empowers your teams to invest in platform improvements, to work off and pay off technical debt, right? Um, but also empowers and enables your platform teams to, to operate and work like a, a, a true product organization, a true, a true startup um, that can also create pull to, to that platform. Right? Um, similarly, on processes, we, we need to drive the standardized engineering approach in the organization um, and also establish a governance that, that enables flow, right? So that, that engineers and, and the platform teams are not stuck in organizational red tape, even though uh, everything else around might be, might be automated, but, but still the governance doesn't allow that, that flow um, through, the, through the platform. Um, and then last but not least, of course, the technology. So um, establishing a developer platform as the one-stop shop that engineers want to use. So really creating this, this pull to the platform are, are key to, uh, to making this, this uh, scaling a success. I hope you, uh, you enjoyed this talk. And uh, Mike and I are both in the platform engineering uh, Slack channel. So feel free to, to ping us there.